are you? Good. I'm How are Savannah. You? Oh, I'm I'm great. <laughs> I'm just getting ahead of I'm myself. I'm gonna interrupt you. <laughs> I'm Savannah. And I'm Alicia. This is Burden of Proof. Welcome everyone. I'm doing well. How are dun, you? Dun, dun. A little allergy Good. today. I'm gonna make a disclaimer today. Yeah. I feel like garbage. I'm not sick. I'm just tired. Yeah, you said you hadn't did slept. Not, I did not sleep well between uh our children staying up late partying. One of them had a sleepover, and the other two were at a birthday party till really late. And then they were all wound up yeah, from all the sugar. Excited. So we didn't get to bed till late, and then I had crazy dreams. Oh, crazy no. dreams! Yeah, my Which dog is was not up. unusual for me. Oh so. yeah, my dog was up at two o'clock in the morning. He had to poop. Yeah, ours had an accident all over mm. our room. That's part of the reason. Too. Oh no, yeah. no! At least he he woke me up and was like, "Please take me outside." I said, "Come on, go to bed." He said. No, I got to go real fast. No, Phoebe Phoebe had to go so bad she didn't she made it like a foot away from her bed. Oh, <laughs> and poor norma- Phoebe. <laughs> and normally she can either wake us up or if she doesn't manage to wake us up, she like does it like right in front of the bedroom door. Oh my god. Because she's like trying to get out. Oh. Um she did not. It was like less than a foot away from her bed dog ownership. <laughs> it's yeah. fantastic. I hope everyone's enjoying all the uh the dog talk this yeah. morning. Yeah. So crazy dreams waking up to clean up dog poop you know so hopefully i'll do this case justice and but if i sound a little off that's probably why but i am excited about this case so i am too because let's talk about this fact i almost did this case this week Uh, and then i changed my mind at the very last minute and alicia was like i think i'm gonna do this case and i was like oh my gosh that's the one i wanted to do great minds think alike they do all right so, y'all already know what case it is, but it's Bernie Tita. It's a pretty big case after, especially because of the Hollywood movie. That's what all the, the reports say. They say Hollywood movie. They don't just say movie. It's Hollywood. Hollywood movie. movie. What's Hollywood the movie called? Bernie. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, many people have already seen, like, a lot of people saw that. And it is... You know, like any Hollywood thing, it's it's based on a true story. There's a lot of truth to it. Some people say it's very accurate. Some people, there's a lot of debate in this case, which is what makes it did you watch especially the movie? interesting. I did. Ooh. I watched the movie. I watched the 48 Hour Special. I read a lot of articles. I tried to find more information on the trial. That was a little tricky. But yeah, and now I, w- I have to watch the movie when I get home tonight. It's interesting because it's supposed to be a comedy. I just realized that the air purifier is on, so if you can hear yeah. that, I apologize. <laughs> Our apologies. I just turned it off. Hopefully a lot of that's better. Noise. <laughs> we'll try and... The room, the, the studio that we're in is really hot, so we have like tons of fans, fans going, and normally we make sure to turn them all off, but that one is my responsibility and I forgot, so. No worries. Shame me. It's okay. I'll do my best to edit it out. All right, so let's jump right in. Bernie's legal name is actually Bernhardt Tita the Second. Wow, <laughs> that is, is a name. Qu- quite a name, Bernhardt Tita the Second. Yes, he. Was, I like the name Bernhardt. Yeah, <laughs> it's like very, Bearhart. It's yeah. very Scottish. Yeah. Um, he was born August second, nineteen fifty-eight, to parents Lay. Leela, I'm not sure if it's Leela or Layla May Jester. And his father, of course, was Bernhardt Tita, the first. first. His father was a Ukrainian immigrant. And um, I didn't find a lot about his mother, but she died when he was just two or three years old. Um, Apparently, in a later interview, I saw that he actually talks about her death and that his father sort of blamed himself for the death because it was a car accident Mm. so uh, a few years after leela's death bernhardt senior married clara catherine willie so he basically grew up with his dad and his stepmom until he was 15 when his dad died and there is some talk about his dad had become a drinker after his mom passed so i did not find out what he died from, but it could have been just health issues mm-hmm. from years of drinking. I'm not sure. 
So one of the claims that comes out later on, actually after the trial and after everything, um, is that Bernie claims that he was molested by his uncle starting at the age of 12. Of course, his uncle says, no, that didn't happen. But, you know, like, what's he going to do? Say, oh, yeah, I totally did that. (laughs) Oh, yeah, big old pervert right here. Yeah. (laughs) 10 o'clock. So it was because of losing so many loved ones at a young age. He was very compassionate and understanding of death and then the comfort that those left behind needed. Most teenagers aren't capable of that. (laughs) They're not ready for that level of emotional intelligence. Um, So it led him to become a mortician. And he actually thrived at this. He was fantastic at it. And he moved to the small town of Carthage, Texas, got a job as an assistant funeral director. I know, an amazing funeral director. Who's you like, got to be a special person oh, to be yeah. a funeral director. Oh, yeah. And he's not creepy at all. He's really funny. Yeah. So that stereotype is not true because there are great... Yeah. Not creepy mortician. Well, yeah. And I mean, directors. and I don't think people like I, I'm sure that I felt like I had heard this before or seen it because now there's even like reality shows of people that run yeah. funeral homes and stuff. But I think everybody kind of thinks that the person that you meet with, the face of the company, mm-hmm. the person that's coming and talking with the families and running the show is not the same person that handled it. Like, it's like there's somebody creepy that likes yeah. dealing with the dead bodies. And then there's these people that are like the salespeople, mm-hmm. the the co- the ones who comfort you. And that's not necessarily true, yeah. especially in a small place like this. Yeah. Like that might be true for bigger places, bigger cities. But in a small town like this, they literally do start to finish everything. Thing. I will say... I do have a core memory of the, one of the very first funerals that I was, like, old enough to remember. Mm-hmm. Uh, they did have a terrifying um, funeral director. He oh, had, yeah. like, too much Botox. He looked really, like, plastic. Oh, and he was like, hello. <laughs> Welcome. The viewing oh. is this way. And I was like, oh, God. Oh, no. <laughs> it wasn't even for somebody that I knew really well. Yeah. So it was just, yeah, that definitely put a bad taste in my mouth. But then I met other people who were great at it. Yeah, of course. So, um, like I said, he had moved to Carthage. He moved there in 1985. He quickly became a beloved member of the community. He was known by pretty much everyone in town um, because he did everything from volunteering at the church and assisting neighbors. He would go above and beyond for his job at the funeral home, getting to know people. He even acted and directed in local plays. Aww. So the local ladies, especially like the elder, like middle-aged to elderly ladies, adored Bernie. Despite the fact that this was a small town in Texas in the 1980s, everybody kind of knew there was talk about him being gay, but he was not out of the closet. Okay. So, like, it was not discussed okay. with him. It's just there was talk about it, but everybody loved him so much they didn't really care. So, yeah, and fair he, enough. And he went to church. He sang on the choir. He taught Sunday school. He did all these things. So they're like, okay, well, if he's a little, you know, what's old churchy people love to say, he's a little light in the loafers. Yeah. <laughs> so, but nobody, like, discussed it with him or gave him a hard time about it. Now, the victim in this case is Marjorie Nugent. She was the wife of Rod Nugent Sr., who made a fortune in the oil industry. From what I gathered, um, at least Marjorie, if not both of them, were actually originally from Carthage, Texas. And then they had moved elsewhere, made a fortune in the oil industry, And in 1989, they moved back to Carthage, and Rod, her husband, had bought a controlling share in a local bank. He was kind of known for being difficult at the bank, and specifically when processing applications for for loans. Mm. He was kind of stingy. But Marjorie was known for being downright mean. Oh, no. And this reputation, like, 
from what I can tell, like followed her throughout her life in this in the town of Carthage. Many of the residents disliked her. Even her extended family members were estranged from her because she just was mean to people. She just could be downright hateful to people. Um, at the time of her death, she like she had a sister that lived in Carthage, mm-hmm. and they weren't speaking. I can't imagine, like, I have siblings that I no longer speak with, but I don't live in a small town with yeah, them. Yeah, Like, I can't imagine, how do you have family members that live in the same small town and you don't see each other, talk to each other, or anything? Yeah. Very strange. So, in an article titled, How My Aunt Marge Ended Up in the Deep Freeze... Oh, my gosh. Wait. Okay. Oh, yeah. I had to process that. We're good to go. <laughs> Marjorie's nephew is actually a reporter, and his name is Joe Rhodes, and he tells in this article of, you know, he gives two really terrible examples of what led to his mom. His mom was the one that she didn't talk to that lived in mm-hmm. town. So he writes of a time when they when he went to visit Marge and she I'm I apologize I my iPad is not cooperating (laughs) so he goes to visit his aunt Marge and for whatever reason like there were issues where she like gave him a hard time about his hair being too long and that he she was gonna send him to a mental institution if he didn't cut it and that she like got after him because he refused to clean out a wasp's nest with his bare hands from someplace in the garden. Now, boy, go, go and get that, go, that wasp nest. So your I hair. don't know. He doesn't really say that that's the reason that she does this, but she ends up locking him in a bedroom in her house for two days and will not let him for call. For two days? For two days. He was 14 years old. She locks him in the bedroom, will not let him call home. Oh, and it, two days. And it isn't, and she still never let him out. The maid let him out when Marjorie went out shopping for the day. And then he called his mom and begged her to come pick him up. Wait, I'm sorry. Why was he there? He was just visiting. He was just visiting? Yeah. He was just visiting. And I, I don't know if my kid, even if my kids were like with a family member, especially if this family member had been known for being not so nice if i didn't hear from them for two days that's a little concerning yeah i might go searching for them so he also claims that marjorie attempted to get gain custody of his sister carrie she went so far as to meet with an attorney to try to have his parents declared unfit by saying that their father was an alcoholic They don't know exactly why, but they believe that she did it because her and Rod only had one child and it was a son. So they believe that she just wanted a daughter. Hmm. Doesn't seem like she's the kind of person who likes children, though. Uh, Yeah, not I not from what I gather, but mean people typically don't. But but there's a lot of that's the crazy thing about this case is there's a lot of. They said, they said. So there's a lot of people who describe her as being mean and hateful and manipulative and abusive. And then there's people that say, no, she was loving. But so it's Mm. hard. Yeah. And everybody kind of lands on one side or the other. I'm I kind of think there's truth to everybody's story. I kind of think there's some truth to both sides. So but we'll get into that after. So. Her husband, Rod Sr., dies in 1990, just a year or so after they moved back to Carthage. And it is at his funeral that Marjorie meets Bernie. He's, of course, the person that handled the funeral arrangements, everything from start to finish, from what I gathered. Um, Selling her a $30,000 gravestone for Rod Sr. to embalming Rod's body to comforting her at the funeral so doing his job yeah doing his job and it wasn't even unusual for bernie to go 
to widows in town to go to them after the Mm -hmm. funerals just to check up on them and make sure that they're holding up okay, to make sure they don't need anything. That wasn't unusual. What was kind of unusual was that Marjorie was, I mean, at best, even if you didn't think she was hateful and, you know, borderline evil, she was a bit curmudgeon I know you don't like that word. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a huge fan of that. No, but I th- but I think it does accurately depict what it means. <laughs> like yeah. you know what you're talking yeah. about. Yeah. So she was difficult. He goes to visit her and check up on her, and she doesn't make it easy. You know, most of these women would gladly let him in and talk and w- want the company, and she turns him away at first. But this is what's unusual. He was persistent. He kept going back until I don't know exactly how many times, but he was, like I said, he was persistent. It wasn't too long before she does accept him. She does accept his company and he becomes her regular companion. Now, the other unusual thing about this is that at the time, Bernie was in his mid 30s. And Marjorie was in her mid to late 70s. Oh, so she's 40 years gosh. his senior. So people in town, of course, start talking about this. Yeah, because it's weird. Because they're like, okay, a 30-something-year-old guy hanging out with an old widow. An old widow that's worth millions of dollars. I was going to say, didn't she buy a $30,000 <laughs> headstone? So yeah. she's got to have and some like money. And like I said, her husband, away. oh yeah, her husband was in the oil industry. Yeah, so they so. were, wor- she was worth millions. Oh my gosh. That, that's just, anytime I think of oil people, I think of that skit with Adam Driver and SNL that just makes me laugh so hard. <laughs> <laughs> this dead bird. <laughs> Go watch it if you haven't I, watched it. I think I did. I think you showed it. Oh, to I'm me. sure I have, because <laughs> I quote it like twice a week. Go watch it. It's the, I <laughs> think honestly, it. after all of the SNL skits I've seen, I think that might be my favorite. Your all time favorite. My all time favorite. Wow. Yeah, that's impressive. It's okay. so good. So <laughs> initially, <laughs> sorry. I should we have laughing. a moment of silence? I started so laughing. Can- <laughs> We got to give Savannah a minute so she can get all her laughs I'm out. Sorry, it's the- such a funny skin. <laughs> and so you shall. Okay, I'm good. So what began as a regular lunch and dinner date kind of companionship fairly quickly turned into traveling the world. Oh. Like they would travel all well, over extensively together. I mean, and friendships are found in weird places. Yeah, I mean. It's it's definitely one of those things that people would look at and go, well, that's kind of strange. But many people did say, despite the fact that they didn't like her, that she seemed happier mm-hmm. than she ever had. She she was having a ball going on these trips and having him as a companion. So that eventually leads that to Bernie quitting his job at the funeral home in 1993 to work for Marjorie full time. Hmm. She hires him to basically be kind of everything. I mean, he was kind of her business manager. She gave him power of attorney. She had him, like, making certain decisions for her. He handled everything. Like, yeah. All the way from that to, like, doing stuff that, like, a housekeeper would do or a or somebody that's like a caretaker would do. Yeah. Like so he helped her with personal care, he did her laundry, he took her on trips. Well, she paid, but, but he, he accompanied like, yeah. her on trips and yeah, so it was kind of like a all the time 24-hour job. It wasn't just, yeah. "Oh, you come here between this time and this time." Well, yeah. and like we know how powerful the power of attorney document is. Yes. Yeah. Yes. When I like signed my own because I have my documents done even though I'm 20. When I like went over that with our attorney, I was like, "Holy crap! I did not realize how all encompassing." That's why it's that is so. That's why when clients come in and have that do their whole plan, and they are always so quick to be like, "Okay, so should I give so and so these documents?" and 
our attorneys always, no, no, (laughs) no, absolutely not. Because the durable power of attorney is in effect the moment that you sign it. And that means they can use it. If you give it to them, even a copy to them, they can start using it. They could go to your bank and say, okay, here, I have power of attorney. Now I want to take all that money out of her bank. They, yeah, Yeah, it is very powerful. It's a catch-22. If you don't have it and then you start to lose capacity to the point that you're not able to sign legal documents, then Then. the people that you want to or or that are trying to help you have to go through this whole other lengthy process of getting guardianship over you in order to make those decisions or assist you in any way. Allegedly. So, (laughs) yeah. In Minecraft. Assuming that they... (laughs) assuming that they're doing it correctly but if you have it then yeah yeah, it opens the door that if you're not very careful with it people can take advantage thing yeah for sure so just to put just to like kind of because when you say travel the world it kind of you think oh well they took vacations they went to europe yeah and they did they did take vacations all over the world to europe to even to India, I think. Mm-hmm. But they regularly would take trips to New York City to see Broadway shows. No. On the weekends. That's sweet, though. Yeah, it just gives you, but it gives you perspective of like how much money she oh, really had. Yeah, that's true. That she can fly them. Like, and he says in a later interview, oh, yeah, we used to, we would fly up on a Friday and come back on Sunday. Mm-hmm. Like it was just, Normal. just a quick weekend trip. From Texas to New York. So, and she even paid for Bernie to uh, get his pilot's license. And she bought him at least one plane. Yeah. Wow. (laughs) So, she was spending quite a money. I mean, as much as she was demanding, you know, the job entailed a lot of demand for him. He was definitely being compensated. He was being paid her family has said that he was getting paid nine hundred dollars a week, plus he gets to go on all these yeah, trips, dang. and and she's al- allowing him up. to have a hobby of pl- flying that the average person could not afford. That yeah. type of hobby, even if that was their big dream. Sign me up, bro. Well, <laughs> <laughs> so she's spending, of course, an exorbitant amount of money on him while she's alive. But she also changed her will, leaving everything to him and excluding her son and granddaughters. Okay. So, of course, they grow increasingly suspicious. And at that point, they asked Marjorie for an accounting of the trust that their father and grandfather, Rod Mm -hmm. Sr., had left, in which case... It was confirmed that he had actually excluded their son as well from okay. the trust in his will. I don't know if that has to do with – that doesn't necessarily mean there was, like, bad blood between them because their son is a doctor. So he yeah, is doing well for himself. Yeah, about that for sure. So – and I know – um you know, as an estate planning paralegal. Yeah, this is like right up our alley. We yeah. do elder law, so. Yes, that's part of the reason that I love this case. Oh, yeah, I'm I'm loving it. And I do probate. I do the, I do the dead part. Yes. So. <laughs> so I know from estate planning, we often have clients come in that will say, oh, I'm just leaving stuff to my grandkids because my kids are doing yeah. well. Like they, they don't need my money, yeah. but I want to leave it to my grandkids. Um. So that isn't necessarily unusual, but apparently this trust that Rod Sr. had was supposed to be, the grandchildren were supposed to be the beneficiaries at least after Marjorie, if Mm -hmm. not like during that time, and she wasn't giving them any money. So they asked for an accounting of the trust, and she refused to give it to them. Huh. And... I imagine that it depends on state law and it depends on how it's written. Yeah. But generally speaking, yeah, if somebody is a trustee of a trust, to my knowledge, they're entitled. The beneficiaries are entitled to see an accounting or to know what is happening with the trust, even though they can't access all the assets themselves. So when she refused, 
the family ends up suing her. And a corporate trustee was appointed to replace her. And it's at that time that the corporate trustee is trying to take, you know, find all the, find out what is in the trust, what assets are in the trust. They're trying to take an accounting of it, and they find that more than $3 million disappeared. Oh, no. It's also about that same time that Marjorie cut off communication with her son and granddaughters. Her granddaughters have said that the last time that they saw her was in 1994 and they went to her house and she kept saying things like, I don't know who you are. You need to leave. I don't know you. And they, and, and so that's like, well, did it, I wonder if did it she felt like start the, to have dementia or, or was it like or, me saying, I don't know you. Cause we're just like, I don't, I'm right. Not. No one that's been interviewed has said like, oh, she started to lose capacity. Everyone said she was with it. So I think that it's yeah. more along that line. Like, I don't know you, you don't come around. Like I, and I don't think they had regular contact cause they all, they lived in Texas, but not in Carthage. And her granddaughters at the time were kind of like college age. Yeah. So, so. they were kind of scattered away at college So they, you know, who stays in close, close contact with their grandparents when you're, like, away at college and trying to live your life and trying to, you know. I mean, some people do, but not if they're mean. Like, I'm not saying that by But the granddaughters swear that she wasn't mean. They're the people that swear that all of this stuff is lies. So. I don't know, man. Elder abuse is so wacky because it's, they're, they're so easy to take advantage of oh absolutely it's so it's so hard to watch yeah and it can be so subtle oh absolutely and it's never it's never the people you think are gonna do it either yeah and it's always who they trust the most like i we've seen some horrible stuff come in and out and Mm -hmm. it's so scary yep So I'm going to jump into the actual murder now, and then we'll get okay. back to some of the, like, what the family says versus what people okay. are saying. Okay. So in November of 1996, Bernie ends up shooting Marjorie four times in the back. And then he places her body in a chest freezer that was located in her pantry. Okay. Um, ouch. Yes. She must have been pretty tiny. Yeah, I think she was. She looks relatively petite in picture and photos. He then spends the next nine months lying to everybody in town. Nine months? Yes. (laughs) Yes. Holy crap. Nine months. Because he was her everything. So he got away with, at first, with like lying about making excuses. Okay, everything from he made all kinds of excuses. He lies about her whereabouts for nine months, and everybody believed him because he, everybody saw him as like this wonderful, lovable guy. He's a great guy, and he's helping this cranky old woman with her life when her family has abandoned her. Nobody talks to her, you know, so everybody viewed him as like an angel, (laughs) so to speak. The problem was is that the lies eventually catch up to him because he was starting both because he was starting to lose track of who he told what because some people he told that she had a stroke and couldn't talk like he would tell like her professional people uh, like her um, financial advisor that's one of the excuses that he gave him as to why she couldn't talk on the phone was that she had had a stroke and she couldn't talk right now and that she was away at in like a nursing facility for rehab after the stroke some people he told them that she went to ohio where her other sister because she had two sisters and that she was visiting the other sister that lived in ohio yeah the problem with that story is that somebody could talk contact the sister yes but nobody did everybody believed him at first well i so i've seen pictures of him he looks like a believable guy yeah. Oh, he, he and, looks like a teddy bear. In interviews, like he's done lots of interviews since being in jail, and he he does. He sounds like 
Like, I look at that guy. I'm like, oh, yeah, I know exactly who he is. <laughs> he's so nice. He's so, and he makes he, great potato salad. And he's got the gay lisp. So yeah. he, so, he doesn't sound... If you just looked at him and or even heard him speak and then were told with no other information, he shot this woman four times in the back, you'd be like, no. No. No way. And so that's that's how the whole town bought it. Wow. Like the whole town thought it. there's no there's no way like even when some people started speculating like I wonder if something weird's going on here. Other people were totally on his side and said there's no way Bernie would do that. Oh my there's gosh. no way. And so, by the way, sorry. That's one more, okay. one more interruption. I just looked at pictures of the freezer. I will be posting them with our photos on Instagram so you can follow them there. Yeah. It's not even that big of a deep freeze. No. Like it wasn't. I was picturing a longer deep freeze. It's much more shallow, like yeah. shorter. Yeah. No, it wasn't very big cuz it was in a little pantry. Yeah. Ugh. So, gosh. So, like I said, he was beginning to forget kind of like keep keeping track of like who he told what. And it really was like the hired professionals in her life that started really questioning. Like oh, because deeply we're, questioning. Because we're trained to look for that. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Particularly her financial advisor oh. was the one. Don't even get me started on financial advisors because they always know. They know everything. Oh yeah. Everything. They know all the drama. They know exactly <laughs> who is what. We it's well, yeah. oh yeah. They know everything. They're the first people. So some of the things that he that tipped him off were that suddenly more far more money was being spent every month than previously. And like we're literally tens of thousands of dollars more. Wow. Come on, be subtle. Because well, I'll get to the because. Don't let me forget to get to the because. Okay. Then Marjorie failed to show up to sign some important documents. And Though th- more money was being spent, Marjorie's bills were not being paid. Not all of the bills. So he was forgetting some of the bills. Wow. Okay. Yeah. That's stupid. Okay. So the financial advisor really pushes the issue. Marjorie's family then gets involved again and notices, like, we haven't been a- like, yeah, we haven't talked to her or seen her since 1994, but now we're trying to contact her and we cannot reach her. Yeah. So they file a missing persons report. And on August 18th, 1997, officers and her family go and essentially yeah. break into her house and find Marjorie in the deep freezer. Oh, I wonder who thought to look in the deep freezer. Actually, what tipped them off was that it had been taped. Oh, I saw that because the they're looking. Yeah, they're looking around for just evidence of like where could she be, and it it was obvious that no one had been in the house because Bernie had his own house. He didn't live with her. Oh, he had his own house. Okay, so he wasn't like living he was in her there. house and living it up. He and actually a lot of the money that he spent. So I will go back to that. A lot of that money that was being spent after she yeah. after he killed her wasn't even on himself he was like buying stuff like he bought cars for people in town that needed new cars he invested in like two different businesses what? in from town like people in town oh, that wanted just to start furthering business. that narrative yes and then he gave like he bought somebody in the movie i didn't read this in an article but in the movie the the hollywood movie the hollywood movie <laughs> Somebody says somebody that they interviewed said that he bought their kid like this huge like playhouse thing for their yard. Yeah, he was just going around like doing all these good deeds, and nobody in town questioned where are you getting all this money, Bernie? <laughs> like, how do you suddenly have she's gone and you suddenly have thousands, tens of thousands of dollars to spend? And he's like, here's my thing you he could have done this so much smarter. Oh, I, like, yeah, we'll get into that. <laughs> we like, will so get into that. We will. Okay, okay. Because uh, that's what okay. that's part of why people didn't believe it either. Like, even once her body was found, yeah. they didn't want to believe that he, like, that it was because, that it was as bad as it was because they're like, there's so many things that don't add up, yeah. like, why it would be done this way if it was premeditated. Yeah. I want to know who opened the freezer because that is who I would be. They are going to be my friend because that's, I would have thought, 
oh no, that's not good. We got to open that. I actually, um, I'm not sure. I know that one of the granddaughters was right there when it was oh, open. No. I don't know if she opened it or if the sheriff opened yeah. it. Oh, definitely. I would have called somebody else to do it, but it would. I would have thought yeah. the same thing. So, thing. yeah, but the tape is what yeah, tipped them sure. off to look in there. So the next day, Bernie is charged with her murder and bond is set for $1.5 million. He immediately confesses. He yeah. no, Like, there's no denying. But in his confession, he claims that for some quite for quite some time before the shooting, Marjorie had become extremely demanding, possessive, and even abusive. She insisted that he wear a pager at all times so she could contact him, and she would interrupt anything when he was out to fly, when he was trying to be a part of the plays that he did, anything. Day and night, she would page him and expected him to come right away. Then she started demanding, like, as much as she felt up to it, going everywhere with him. So as much as possible. Okay. Annoying, but not murder worthy. Yeah. So, but he became, you know, just overwhelmed with how much she was expecting. This would not happen to a Gen Z person. Is what he We would be like, excuse me, no. Yeah. So he tells investigators that he doesn't really know what happened or why it happened, but that it wasn't intentional. He didn't plan it. He does admit that, like, he basically says, I loved her, but I will admit, like, I thought about her death. I would think about her death, but never in my dreams of her dying was I the one to kill her? It was always just she's elderly, she yeah. dies, or it's an accident, or something like that. And was it horrible to say that? Like, I, I get that. I understand. Like, I believe when he says he doesn't know what happened, that sometimes you just... Yeah, and I don't know that he was claiming of, like, blacking out. He just was saying, "Yeah, I just can't explain why, why it, happened. it happened. Like, I, that makes way more sense to me than people were like, I blacked out. Yeah. I, I don't I he never used the word blackout as far as I could he just tell. said yeah that so like okay that tracks I don't know I was a caretaker it is exhausting yeah oh never absolutely did I think about like her death or killing her but but you just get tired absolutely. oh it's exhausting but I mean so part of me understands that there were days where I would be like why did I just yell at her she's she doesn't know what she's doing but I never would have caused her harm right she was my grandmother and i loved her very 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 much yeah but But, i do know how tiring it is yes so when asked you know about the body like okay so you don't know why you did what you did or how that happened exactly but why did you put the body in the freezer and this actually tracks with his whole thing yeah. If you think about it, because he says he didn't dispose of the body because everyone deserves a proper burial. And so he was just waiting until a time that he could give her a proper burial. The thing that doesn't track with that is some of the things that other people speculate or question, which is, okay, so you were going to wait till you gave her a proper burial, but you had nine months, number one. Number two, basically people think that he maybe wanted to get caught and that's why he left her in there instead of burying her somewhere. Yeah. Because some of the locals would say, why didn't he just suffocate her with a pillow? Because she is 80 years old and had heart problems. So if he had just, he had access to her house at all times, even though he didn't live there, he could have just suffocated her with a pillow and because she's old and had heart problems they wouldn't have likely done oh, well, an autopsy they died. just would have been like oh she died in her sleep yeah you know well they might have still done they might have still done an autopsy because anytime i think circumstantially anytime anybody with money or any kind of def- fall i know yeah. even if she suffocated well, with pillow, family, she has money yeah the medical examiner might have said Mm, let's check it out let's check it out anyway like well and i don't doubt that her family would have stepped in and requested one yeah because they were already suspicious of him so (laughs) one thing that did crack me up is in the movie i i'm assuming that all of the all of the little interviews 
that they do with local townspeople in the mm-hmm. movie are actual things that people said. people said because they did try to stick to truth. I'm sure they kind of dramatized some of it, but um, according to that Joe Rhodes, her nephew, yeah. in his article that he wrote about it, like he went on set, he had a hand and like oh, talked nice. with them. The director and the and even the cast, like they did their research for sure. So I'm assuming that at least some of the things that the townspeople in the movie said are actual things that townspeople <laughs> said. And one lady said, well, I just don't understand why he didn't. He has a plane. He could have just flown her over the Gulf of Mexico and dropped her body in the water. Except, of course, there's flaws in that. Because I'm like, how is he going to? He he literally flew, like, prop planes. Yeah, not, yeah. Not, you can't like, just, like, sneak a body he onto a plane. Dr- like, fly the plane and go to the back and drop the body without involving a second person that's and also like how you can't just like take off from anywhere so you have to take the body to uh (laughs) yeah there's so many flaws in that plan (laughs) but like i understand where she's coming from yes so all righty so of course we know we know who did it the question is was it premeditated i don't think so yeah because if it was he could have done it so much better so he goes to jail. He goes to prison. He's in prison. It takes a couple years. Actually, three. It's three years from. I mean, of course, he wasn't caught until 1997. So a couple years from that point, in February of 1999, the the first trial takes place. Many of the residents in Carthage were giving the prosecutor, Danny Buck Davidson, is his name. They were giving him a hard time. For even charging Bernie. <laughs> oh, my because God. Because they love Bernie that much. What do and, they want him to do? Just let him go? And they couldn't believe that he did it intentionally. I think they wanted him to just drop the charges from murder to, like, manslaughter or something. Okay. Um, because they just could not believe that he did it intentionally. So it became evident by how much they were pestering him that, like, he can't have the trial there. Because they're not going to get a neutral jury. Yeah. So he petitioned to have the jury or to have the trial moved to another county. What big case did that happen in? I want to say Bundy, but I don't think it was Bundy. There was like a, there's a really big one that they ended up moving for that reason. Yeah. Sorry. I'm trying to think of it. I I haven't done extensive research on Bundy, so I don't Mm. remember, but. That doesn't sound right. Yeah. But yeah, I get what they're saying. A lot of it is just showing proof of was this him taking advantage of her or was it just as he said, which is, no, I enjoyed her company, but it became abusive and then I snapped and then, okay. But in February February 9th, 1999, the jury finds Bernie guilty of murder. Oh, yeah. O.J. Simpson. Oh, And it's yeah. called change of venue is the legal Ch- phrase. Yes. Change of venue. Yeah. And it was OJ. Yeah. No, that's right. I'm old enough to remember that. I remember right where I was when I watched the Bronco chase. Oh, my gosh. I was at my uncle, my great aunt and uncle's house in Tennessee. That was right around my birthday, too. Wow. It's like, happy, happy birthday. birthday. <laughs> happy Car birthday chase. to me. Um, Yeah, he's so. out now living his life. OJ, if you're listening. Oh, yeah. Um, But, yeah, they had a change of venue. I'm Yeah. But of course they convicted him. That of was murder. such a huge case though. Like you had to. You have to, but even that would be difficult. Like, where do you go? Because everybody knew. I mean, that was such a huge case. Uh-huh. So okay, don't get me started talking on that. <laughs> Stay um, focused. But obviously he got convicted of murder. He did yeah. it. He admitted he did it. Yes, but it was like I said, it was a difference of was it premeditated or yeah. not. So yes, they f- the jury said yes. And oh, they three, did. Yeah. Three days later, he was sentenced to life and had a $10,000 fine. Do you know why? Um, I wasn't sure if maybe their, their final statement said what suggested that it was premeditated. I don't recall exactly, but I think it was just the evidence. It does look really bad. Like you're. Well, and he had stolen woman, money from her before. And he, yes. documents were changed. He had power of attorney, like all yeah. of that stuff. It looks looks bad. Super bad. Yeah. 
So life sentence at the time in Texas, I believe, meant that he would be eligible for parole after 40 years. Okay. Okay. Now, this is where Hollywood enters the picture. Years later, in 2012, director Richard Linklater released the movie Bernie, starring Jack Black. Oh, I've got to watch that. As Bernie. Shirley MacLaine as Marjorie and Matthew McConaughey as Danny Buck Davidson, the prosecutor. Those had some big names. Yeah. This was here. <laughs> it's weird to me. They did their research, but it's so it's supposed to be true, but it's also like a dark comedy. It's supposed to be a comedy. Now, oh, yeah, I tell you, there was only a couple times that I laughed and most of the time I just felt uncomfortable. I'm not going to lie. Because it's Jack Black, you're like, this is a comedy, right? Except... You're like, this is a true crime. Well, this How isn't is, very funny. This is not funny. Why is this? I, I just I felt very weird <laughs> watching the movie. Well, I know what I'm doing tonight. Nicholas is working, so I will be watching. Yeah. So they did, like I said, though, the cast, even Jack Black went to the prison and spent a lot of time interviewing Bernie himself so that he could get a feel wow. for how he's supposed to act and how Bernie felt at that time and wow. all of it. Bernie is free on YouTube and Peacock. Yes. Yes. It and is. Amazon Prime Video. Mm-hmm. There you go. It is. So Linklater um, and, and the cast are having these moments there. They have Joe Rhodes, the nephew, the nephew. of Marjorie, come on set while they're doing which he said was like surreal seeing Shirley MacLaine it was really like being there with his aunt again wow yeah well that's good so according to some people the Hollywood movie represented was fairly accurate in many many ways but Marjorie's son and granddaughters of course were very upset by the movie and started to speak out They insisted that they were not estranged from her, even though they hadn't seen her since 1994, which I'm like, do you not understand the word (laughs) estranged? They say that all the talk of her being horrible and hateful is nonsense, that she was very loving. They have even um, started a website, MarjorieNugent.com, in which they post like family photos and but I find it very interesting because you'll just go visit the site because you read it and you're like, but you don't really like you have some photos, but there's no like descriptions of the photos or like this is at our family reunion or this is like there's yeah. not a lot of detail into why it is that they say she wasn't mean or wasn't horrible. They just say she wasn't. But yet everybody that claims she was mean and was horrible has examples. examples. So I found that very interesting. And I'm not saying that the the two can't, they're not, they don't, they're not mutually exclusive. She could have been very loving with her family and her granddaughters, but then with everybody else, she was not. True. So her granddaughters to this day claim that Bernie killed Marjorie because he was already stealing money from her and he was about to get caught. Okay. Fair enough. So. That is their story. They are sticking to it. I don't know if it could be it, but it could be all of it. I that's how I feel about it. Like I, I could not pick a side. I'm not going to pick a side. I'm not going to say, oh, I think Bernie yeah. is this really great. I think it's entirely possible that Bernie never intentionally, like I don't know that he started the relationship and started hanging out with her because that was his goal, but. Money does strange things to people. They do. Yeah, it does. Number one. And number two, like you said, like she could have been loving and kind and whatever. Like she obviously, as the family, the extended family says, she went so far as to see an attorney and try to get custody of her niece. And they think she just did it because A, she didn't have a daughter and she wanted a daughter. And B, she didn't like her brother-in-law. So, if she always wanted a daughter and then her only son has three daughters, of course she's going to be kind to you. Like, I mean, she would have no reason not to be kind to you. Yeah. So interesting. But that doesn't mean she wasn't 
unkind to other people yeah in her life so i yeah well i don't know what to think no me either so after the movie's release um it, i believe it was actually at the initial showing they opened it in austin texas where link later is actually a resident um, appeals attorney Jody Cole approached him to ask if he had any more information on the trial because she believed there's something more here. There's something that that they missed in the trial that would have shown that it wasn't premeditated, that there were mitigating oh my gosh. factors. Okay. So Linklater gives her his box of research that included the transcripts from the trial Cole discovers in her investigation that Bernie had never shared anything about his childhood abuse. Huh. So he didn't tell his own defense team. He didn't say it in court. Nothing. I don't know exactly how she found that out, but she found out. And so in 2014, Cole assisted Bernie with an appeal claiming that the abuse factor should have been you know, should have mitigated it. Okay. Bernie was evaluated. Here's why. Because I know you're giving me, the, you're giving me the skeptical eye. I am. I am skeptical. But here's why. Bernie was evaluated by a psychiatrist who deemed that he had had a disassociative experience at the time of the shooting. When they knew about the abuse. So this is the new psych eval. The psych eval that the prosecution had had done at the original trial had only concluded that Bernie's relationship with Marjorie was toxic and dysfunctional. But once that psychiatrist hears about the new psych eval and hears about the abuse, he too concludes and says that it was likely that he had a disassociative episode. Oh, so he just kind yeah. of checked out in the moment and all of his childhood abuse and all of the abuse he was withstanding from her kind of came to he but he disassociates like the good side of Marjorie and the good stuff and yeah. shoots her. Trauma. So both Trauma responses are crazy. Yes. So both psychiatrists agreed that Bernie w would not be a danger to anyone else. Yeah, I, I mean, don't think... assuming that no one else is abusing him. <laughs> yeah. You know. So, he was granted a new sentencing trial or hearing. Okay. And he was released on $10,000 bond under specific conditions, including that he would stay with Richard Linklater, the director of the movie. So, that's how close they became. Wow. And that he would seek psychological help to help him process all his trauma from the abuse so this trial too had to be moved to a nearby county because it still yeah. was such a big deal that actually this time neither side felt that they would have a fair trial however it didn't work in bernie's favor it actually hurt him oh no in 2016 he was sentenced to not life but 99 years in prison 99 years to life and sent back to prison after being out for two years. Oh, gosh. That's rough. The judge did, however, dismiss theft charges that had been brought against him because all these years later, the family had done their investigating and then they pushed and then they were trying to bring charges against him for the theft of all the money that went missing. In one interview with them, they claimed that at some point they found copies of deposit slips where Marjorie had given him, I don't know if it was cash or check, they didn't specify, but she had been giving him as her business manager mm -hmm. stuff to deposit into her bank accounts. And he falsified deposit slips saying, yes, I deposited it in your account. And he actually deposited it elsewhere in okay. his own accounts. But the judge dismissed those charges because it came too late and she agreed with the defense counsel that it would uh, have violated his right to a speedy trial. Fair enough. And he's already being sentenced to 99 years Yeah, what in else prison, is it really like, going to do? I mean. Yeah. 
So in 2017, Bernie appealed yet again, claiming that the prosecuted uh, reneged on the agreement to a lesser sentence at that time and that his confession was illegally obtained because I don't know what the details are on that because like I told you before we started recording that it was difficult to find in, in the appeals. It just, there wasn't, it was weird reading the Texas appeals. Like it, they were very brief. There wasn't as much detail as there usually is in other States that I've read appeals. So I'm not sure what the details are be- behind his claim that they were illegally obtained, but as far as the movie went, as far as 48 hours went, as far as his interviews after the fact went, it seemed like he was always pretty open, so I don't know yeah. how they how they made that claim. Well, appeals will try anything they can to get anything to stick. So. Yeah. Well, of course, it didn't go they said no and they affirmed his 99-year sentence. Wow. So Bernie is still in prison today, and Marjorie's family continues to profess that she was not the monster people that made her out to be, and simply a victim of elder financial exploitation. I don't even know what to say. I know, I don't know how I feel. I know, right? Pretty crazy. That's a wacky one. Pretty crazy. Well, but I think you did a great job. Thank you. I didn't get it's one definitely one of those cases you can dive in deeper and, you know, draw it out because there's so much he said she said. Yeah. Stuff back and forth, but I like I said, I was so on the fence. Like if I had fallen on one side or the other, I might have gone that route, but I'm so yeah, on the it's like hard to tell. it's I'm not saying Bernie TD. I will say when you watch interviews with him, he does come across as a very sincere guy. I don't know if he really is that manipulative, but like most people tend to believe him. I don't believe that he was like an evil person who just like dreamt this up. I think that it was genuinely just the straw that broke the camel's back happened. And I kind of fall on that too. And I think I definitely think think there's something to the theory of him wanting to get caught and not giving her a proper yes. burial because he didn't. He still like he still to this day in interviews will cry about it. So I think he genuinely did. F- I agree with that. Yeah. I agree that there was a part of him that wanted to probably get caught because he felt so guilty about it. And he was Christian and he very much was, you know, yeah. and he has since come out as gay like now he'll openly say yes i'm a gay man but at the time he didn't and so i can only imagine that's another factor to consider in my book is that when people are living in the closet so to speak the amount of stress and anxiety and depression that they experience because just because they're not being open and honest with themselves or anybody else around them that alone is a lot to handle and then when you have somebody you're in this relationship and they're borderline abusive and god only knows what she said to him Uh like god only knows if she ever said anything derogatory in that respect we don't know her family says oh no she was very much in love with him and he took advantage of that he says no we were just really good friends and companions i was gonna say are they dating or were they like to him he says no there are some other witnesses that are not family members that do say that they would see them together and that it it appeared more like a romantic relationship but then other people said no he was just very lovey and that's just kind of how he was so but the man talks and you can clearly i mean he's not a guy that could have hidden even though he was technically in the closet yeah like he wasn't hiding it well He, he talks with that classic lisp he loved broadway he acted he he did like all the all the typical stereotypical things especially for back then and in texas and in texas and he grew up in texas like it's not like he was influenced by other people or other things like no he grew up in a small town in texas absolutely so well this was fascinating because i not not that I love elder abuse, but I do think that it's a fascinating subject. That's why I do what I do. 
Um, yep. It's insane. So this was really great. I, you did a great job. And Thank I you. hope you guys enjoyed it. I hope you guys hope geeked out as much as we did because yes. we liked all of the, <laughs> that aspect of it was really cool. Thanks for listening. Thanks for talking. Thank you. Oh, absolutely. All right. Thanks for listening, everyone. Bye. Till next time. Bye. Thanks for listening, guys. Find us on Instagram and TikTok at Burden of Proof Pod and email us at burdenofproofpod at gmail.com. Ooh.